Uh, I want to thank, before we begin, Stephanie Coakley, the director of the Pequot Library, and um, uh, Jennifer Pratt, and also Christine Caron for helping me right now. Uh, we're not all majors in technology, so it's wonderful to have support. I want to thank John Herzog, who was a friend who uh, brought my name to the attention of Stephanie Coakley to um, give this talk. So I'm grateful to all of you, and it's a pleasure to be at the Pequot Library, just remotely, but I've been there in person. It's a wonderful place. So if there's anybody here listening who has never been inside the Pequot Library, and especially for their annual book sales, I recommend that you look it up once COVID is passed. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We're really excited to have you here giving your talk about the coal first firing. Can't wait to learn some new things about this, especially um, it's in conjunction with our, um, our Revolutionary War exhibit, that Riot, Sedition, and Insurrection. Mm. Um, and that is scheduled to come down on September 27th, but it can be viewed during our browsing hours today until 6 three to five this Friday and two to four on Saturday. So if you're in the area, please stop by. Um, Elizabeth Tan Kaplan is an historian and the creator of the New York Historical Society's award-winning exhibit, Spies, How a Group of Long Island Patriots Helped George Washington Win the Revolution. She is also the former director of education for the Three Village Historical Society in Setauket, along Long Island Sound, where General George Washington's best organized and most successful spiring operated during the American Revolution. There's a lot of legend surrounding the story of the Washington spiring, and as an historian, Elizabeth sets out to separate fact from folklore. So I'm sure we'll all, we'll all learn a lot from her today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, shall we begin? Welcome all. And I'm screen sharing. Does everybody see that first screen, please? And now uh, here we come to the uh, main story, which is the people involved. Of course, we have George Washington as the spy master extraordinary. Underneath his portrait is that of Benjamin Talmadge. It's the only other live sketch we have. That was done by John Trumbull, uh, son of the governor of Connecticut, Jonathan Trumbull. But John Trumbull was going to be a famous artist later but he was in the revolution right alongside of, of uh, Benjamin Talmadge and he sketched this portrait. We're very glad to have it. Every other image you see is somebody's imagination. And as you look at this, you'll notice that there are men. We have Austin Rowe and Robert Townsend. We have Caleb Brewster in a whale boat. And we have Abraham Whittle chatting with Caleb, uh, Caleb Brewster. We don't have any women in this image. And you might wonder why, and I'll go and tell you why. Uh, let's take a look at um, the literature that's out there right now, the exhibits that are out there right now about Washington spies. In 2006, um, Alexander Rose wrote a wonderful book, very well documented, pages and pages of references and bibliography and notes. Every detail that you would want to know about the spy ring was seemed to be in that book. I read that book, was thrilled, and created an exhibit with my colleagues at the Three Village Historical Society called Spies. We did that in 2010. And then um, interesting people started coming by the exhibit. One was a man named Craig Silverstein, who turned out to be a writer, turned out to write turn. And another was Brian Kilmeade, who came one day with his adorable family and friends and spent a couple of hours. And then he came out with a book in 2016. When Turn came out, I was one of the many who could hardly wait to see it. And I was um, a little shocked at the bending of the truth about um, certain characters, which we'll talk about more later. But 2014 was that year, and many of you who are listening today may have tuned in to the four seasons of Turn. Uh, in 2014, Alexander Rose also came out with a new version of his Washington Spies, utilizing the publicity of Turn, and there's a little uh, logo at the bottom telling you to watch, and then some of the characters from Turn are shown on the cover. 
So Turn was a big influence in the, um, the awareness of the American people as a whole about the spy ring. And by the way, I must tell you that we at the Free Village Historical Society are grateful for it because the attendance at our spies exhibit, which began in 2010 with maybe oh, half a dozen people coming up on a Sunday when it's open. And now at tur uh, after turn, we've got lots of people, sometimes as many as a dozen or more. So thank you, turn. However, there are some serious errors in fact, and we'll be talking about that. Um, Brian Kilmeade's book also came out and he talked about a spy that wasn't even in the spy ring, the culprit spy ring, but he calls a book Washington's Secret Six. So that was a little surprising. And then recently there have been two more books and there's still many more. You've probably read some I haven't even seen yet. Well, in this um, our talk, I'm going to try to point out some things that are true and not true about what people have said about the cult aspiring. For instance, in the first one, the question is, was Abraham Woodall, who is the hero of the story, and Anna Smith Strong, who doesn't appear in my image that you just saw, were they lovers? That's a big plot in the story. And then another uh, plot is, did Anna learn to write in code? And was she the main force behind the, uh, the spy ring? She seemed to be prodding a Woodall uh, along every inch of the way. Was that true? Then we talk about Abe Woodham as a family man. Here he is with his wife, Mary, and his little boy. Was he a family man during the American Revolution? That was really a big plot uh, point, too. Was it true? And then Mary and Abe moved into the elegant home of his father, Richard Woodall, a judge, a prominent judge, a, a loyalist, as a matter of fact. Uh, was that true? Was Richard Woodall a loyalist? And did Mary and Abe move into their home at one point after their own home was burned to the ground? And by the way, was their home burned to the ground? We'll be finding out about that too. Well, two characters, Caleb Brewster here on the left and, and Dragoon Major Benjamin Talmadge, were, were they really close friends? They're shown as very close friends in turn. And then this man, Major Robert Rogers, was he as dangerous and villainous as he was depicted? Um, actually, four of these uh, little slides I showed you are not true, and two of them are, and it'll be up to you to guess, I guess, which ones are true and after I talk. But now let's begin with the real story about the American Revolution and George Washington. You know these three famous portraits probably. The one on the left is of him in a British uniform uh, during the French and Indian War when he was only 23 years old. During the Revolution, of course, 20 some odd years later, he could be played by John Wayne as a strong, silent type, a, a great leader who would command attention whenever he walked into the room, said very little, but what you said you could trust. He was picked to be commander. And now, of course, there's the portrait of him on the dollar bill by Gilbert Stewart. This was painted at the end of his second term when he was tired and worn out from years of service to this country. What he said in 1755, as a 23-year-old, there's nothing more necessary than good intelligence to frustrate a designing enemy. Nothing requires greater pains to, obturn, to obtain, pardon me. And the portrait is by Charles Wilson Peel, who was actually in the army also, the uh, Continental Army later on. So Washington was a spy master extraordinary. Um, and he always knew that to win any war, at least in his day and probably even today, you have to have eyes on the ground and ears at the door and feet on the ground. <laughs> Thank you. So this is going to be a little prologue. I hope you'll forgive me. I'll go as fast as I can just to set the stage to show you why the culprit firing was so badly needed and what they had to overcome. So there's the Battle of Lexington, April 75 in Massachusetts. Um, nobody's sure who won that one, but uh, it was called the shot heard round the world. Three months later at Bunker Hill, a portrait by John Trumbull, the son of that governor of Connecticut, uh, showing the uh, death of one of the officers, a great exaggeration here. But again, the Battle of Bunker Hill 
um, concerned the King of England, King George III, very much because at the Battle of Bunker Hill, there were so many wounded officers and uh, dead officers and wounded soldiers that when the barrels of the officers came back to London, because the burials of uh, officers were not held usually here, but back home, it was only the common soldiers who were buried here. King George watched those barrels rolling off and he said, this has got to stop. Let's remember that he was about the age of Prince William today when he was coronated. Uh, by the time the revolution began, he was in his mid thirties towards forties, had made some serious mistakes that made us all quite angry in the colonies. I won't go into them. George Washington was made commander in chief unanimously by Congress right after Bunker Hill, June 19, 1775. He wore his uniform to Congress every single day. And that might have given them the idea that he wanted the job. But the most important thing, as you probably know, was that he was from Virginia. And it was important to have united colonies. New England had begun most of the problems, although they were certainly fighting in the South. But the, the support of Virginians was important. He reviewed his troops up in Cambridge in July. This is a year before the Declaration of Independence. We're really at war a year before the Declaration of Independence. Well, with a great military strategy and the help from Henry Knox, who brought cannon from Fort Ticonderoga over the mountains to Boston, um, Washington was able to get the British fleet to leave Boston Harbor. They had been blockading it for quite a while. It was time for them to go. And where did they go? They went to Canada, which was now in their hands. They won it from the French. So from Boston, those British ships went up to Halifax and stayed there. But George Washington knew they wouldn't stay there long. They would come back and they would not come back to Boston. They would come back to New York. And why was that? Because of that river that we all know and admire so much, the Hudson. It was called the North River then. It separated New England from the rest of the colonies. Whoever controlled New York City, right here at the mouth of the Hudson, controlled entry into the interior. Controlling New York, including Long Island, was the key to winning the war. And here I've just put in Fairfield and Setauket so that you can see that they're not all that far apart as one looks at the entire spectrum. So again, the ships came back from Halifax and went right into Boston Harbor. A few months later in Philadelphia, the Declaration of Independence is presented on June 28th, and they were going to discuss it. We weren't sure we were going to be a separate country. Meanwhile, the war has come to New York, and the first British ships arrived in New York Harbor one day after the Declaration of Independence was introduced in Congress. So those men, uh, a couple of days horse ride away from New York, were really quite brave to undertake the revolution, knowing that this vast military fleet was right on our shores, ready to pounce. And the Declaration nonetheless unanimously taken the 13 colonies of the United States. It was passed on July 4th, August 2nd it was signed. So after the ships started coming into the harbor, those delegates still had the courage to sign that document. By August 15th, almost 400 British ships were in New York Harbor, 32,000 British and Hessian soldiers. Let's put that in context. The, the entire population of New York City was 25,000. So uh, King George III in England had what we might call a Donald Rumsfeld's uh, words, shock and awe. He wanted to overpower the colonists before the revolution got underway and out of hand. So a great battle took place on Long Island in Brooklyn on August 27th, when all those ships were here in the harbor. And a young lieutenant named, named Lieutenant Benjamin Cal uh, Talmadge took part in it. Okay. Now, um, let me just go back a moment and show you Brooklyn. Forgive me for slipping slides here. Um, for those of you who are aware, Brooklyn is part of New York City. I'm sure we're all aware of that. And that's where this battle is going to take place. But it's called the Battle of Long Island because Brooklyn and Queens are part of Long Island. 
Now, here's the battle, pretty grim. British and Hessian troops, 20,000, all of them well supplied with muskets, bayonets, cartridges. Officers well-trained, disciplined, experienced. On the, the continental side, American troops, 8,800. That's about one third of what the British had on at the, at the battle. The soldiers had, few of them had uniforms, bayonets, or cartridge boxes. Most had muskets and powder horns because they were farmers. They'd come from their farms with their own materials. They were not well-trained, disciplined, or experienced, and George Washington had his hands full. Well, it was a rout, to tell you the truth. It was quite a horrible defeat. And here we see a painting by Alonso Chappell, three generations after the event, showing the people running away at the Battle of Long Island. In the distance, you might see the Delaware troops and the Maryland forces who held back the British to allow the uh, rebels to escape. Well, there was only one choice for Washington, and that was to retreat. That famous retreat is sort of as the Dunkirk of, of the American Revolution. It's celebrated by a stamp here, 150th anniversary, 1776 to 1951, because this retreat one uh, planned masterfully by Washington, who always planned ahead and had plenty of boats ready to catch, to um, bring his troops across the East River. So there we have it. Now, what are we looking at? We're looking at what Huntington and Norwalk have to do with this revolution. As George Washington led his army north across uh, from, from the east, uh, across the East River from um, Brooklyn and had to lead them through Westchester and on to Peekskill and across the Hudson River with the British hot on their heel, on his heels. He's gonna be gone in um, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and upstate New York for the rest of the revolution. Um, he's going, this is going to be the longest war that we've ever had, except for the current undeclared war in Afghanistan. The revolution lasts seven years. And so from 1776 until November 1783, we are not going to see George Washington in New York. He, he needs spies. He needs spies desperately to get information about the British who are now in New York Harbor, in New York City, and on Long Island. And one young man volunteers, and his name, as you know, is Nathan Hale. Um, he was a, a lieutenant and then a captain and dying to fight. And when Washington called for uh, a... Um, a spy to help him in Long Island and New York, he volunteered. He was, he was taken across on a large uh, American ship, the uh, Schuyler, uh, that passed from Norwalk to Huntington. And then he was left to walk on, uh, on his feet alone with no safe house, no spy support anywhere. He was asked to walk across Long Island into New York City gathering information. He stopped at a tavern in Flushing, in Queens today, and uh, rested overnight. Now, he was probably the world's most naive spy. He was brave, but he and he was eager, but he was naive. And he probably had a few drinks in the tavern, and he came across this man, Major Roger Roberts. He was of the Queens Rangers, an American troop on the Queen's or the King's side, called the Queen's Rangers, fighting for the British. And he was in the tavern because he suspected that Nathan Hale, who had been spotted walking along um, in Queen's by uh, some of Roger's men, uh, he was spotted as being a likely um, suspect. And so Rogers went into that tavern and convinced him that he was a patriot. Well, Rogers immediately captured him. The next day he was brought into Manhattan. Something had happened in Manhattan overnight. It burned. A quarter of Manhattan burned to the ground. Nobody knew who started the fire. Somebody blamed the British, somebody blamed the Patriots, but 
Nonetheless, September 21st, 1776, New York City was on edge, and the British commander, William Howe, did not waste any time when Robert Rogers and his men brought in from the night before the man they'd captured. And uh, Hale was in civilian clothes, and so he was not entitled to a military um, trial, and he didn't have one. And so he was hung. He was hung without a trial uh, on what is now probably 66th Street and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. Right then it was called the Artillery Park. It was also an orchard. And it was way north of where the action was, uh, way north of uh, Canal Street. And most of Manhattan was really below Canal Street at that point. So he was hanged. Uh, he, I hate to disabuse you, but he did not say those words. I regret that I have been one life to lose for my country. That was a quote from a play he'd read at, at Yale. He had been a student in Yale with Benjamin Talmadge. And um, a friend of theirs, uh, long after the revolution, when uh, Americans were looking for heroes to thank, the name Nathan Hale, Nathan Hale was raised. And um, a friend of theirs at the memorial service said those words, but Nathan Hale did not. Sorry. Well, now um, Washington still needs spies. And meanwhile, the British have decided they need to get more food, more, more hay for their horses. They have to build um, forts, etc. They have to find a place that has wonderful supplies. And Long Island was a paradise. It still is for many of us. And it was a farmland. So the British came out there uh, having to restock since they had thought the war would, over, would be over very quickly, but it's now three or four months later. And the British and Hessian soldiers just take whatever they need, bags of flour, they melt down silver for bullets, and then uh, people are quartered in the house, there could be a knock on the door, and the owner of the house would find five British soldiers or Hessian soldiers, this is the Hessian hat, and this is the British hat. And um, they would be asked, uh, how many beds have you got? And then uh, the uh, person would be told that he had to house as many soldiers as he could house comfortably, and his wife would have to feed them. They might or might not get paid. So people were not too happy. And you can imagine that many Long Islanders, including patriots and loyalists, were unhappy with the British occupation. And in 1777, uh, Washington arranged to have boats sent over to Long Island in a South Hold, not Southport in Connecticut, but South Hold on Long Island. People lined up to flee to Connecticut. And by the way, at the same time, loyalists were fleeing from Connecticut into Manhattan because Connecticut was still in Patriot hands. And uh, there were refugees everywhere. When we read about refugees today, it's nothing new. Wars create refugees. So this is the number of people who fled to Connecticut in 77. 15% 15, 15 of Long Island's population of about 27,000. That comes to about 4,050, if my math is right. And 10% of Suffolk County's entire population of about 16,000, 7,800. So George Washington still needs a spy ring, but he hasn't thought of the word ring yet. Neither has his leader, Nathaniel Sackett. He picked this man, Washington picked Nathaniel Sackett, who was a, a civilian, and he lived in Dutchess County, which is north of Westchester, New York. And he was assigned the task of uh, locating spies, supervising spies. He was given a salary, $50 a month, so he's really a spy master. But Washington also assigned him an assistant, somebody to work with him, Benjamin Talmadge, who by this time is a major in the Dragoons, and the drawing that John Trumbull did of him shows him wearing the hat of the a major of, uh, of the Dragoon outfit. Dragoons, by the way, are soldiers who fight both on horse and on foot, and uh, the name of the regiment was the Second Continental Light Dragoons, and also known as Sheldon's Horse because Alicia Sheldon was the colonel and organized the group. Let me get back to Nathaniel Sackett. I 
forgive the digression. I included his date of death because Turn, when they included him as a character, and this is a shot, a slide from Turn, um, he, they had Nathaniel Sackett die a very unpleasant death. So I'm sure you're glad to know that Nathaniel Sackett, in turn, did not die. He lived to 1805. Now, in the meantime, there's a man from Setauket who is in the military with um, Major Benjamin Salmage, and um, his name is Caleb Brewster. He was born in Setauket. He's a friend of Talmadge. He's fighting with him, but he's an independent spirit. And at this point in August 7th, 1777, this is long before the spy ring is really formed, Lieutenant Caleb Brewster wrote a letter to General Washington telling him he wanted to spy on British shipping and uh, army uh, posts. And he mailed this from Norwalk, Connecticut, which is near where he was stationed. So he was a loner then. He wasn't in the spy ring. And um, George Washington accepted him, but he appointed General Charles Scott to work both with Hackett and with uh, Talmadge uh, to uh, oversee spy operations. General Charles Scott was given the task of monitoring Brewster. But General Charles Scott was also busy organizing campaigns, and he left a lot of the work to Benjamin Talmadge, who showed a great talent and interest in it. And by the fall of 77, uh, George Washington has named Dragoon Major Benjamin Talmadge Director of military intelligence. So he's now going to be in charge of the spies. Sackett is gone and uh, Scott is gone as spy masters. So this is the birth of the cult for spy ring. And the first thing that we have to recall is that Benjamin Talmadge and Nathan Hill were best friends at Yale. They were roommates together. They studied Cato together with that, with that uh, quote that supposedly Nathan Hill said came from. And one thing you can be sure is that Benjamin wanted to keep his spies safe. He, he turned first to a friend from Setauket, Abraham Woodle. He'd grown up with him. They'd gone to the same one-room schoolhouse. They went to the same Presbyterian church that his father was the minister of. And he knew Woodhull was the patriarch. And what about Abraham Woodle? He's played in turn in the, in the uh, AMC program turn by Jamie Bell, and that's perfect casting because Abraham Woodle was a very slim man, very small man, a frail man, and he was a sickly man. But he was also a smuggler, and that's what I find interesting. Uh, he was a farmer, that was his main livelihood. He was the sole support of his mother and father, aging parents who lived with him and his older sister. So why would he have to smuggle? He needed money. And that was called in the 18th century, smuggling in New York was called the London trade, where Abraham Woodle could bring his cabbages and other farm produce into Manhattan and barter it away, not to, for money, because the money was not worth much, not worth a continental, as they said. He would barter it for quality goods like silks and tea that people liked to drink and couldn't get. And then he would take it into Connecticut um, with his horse and wagon uh, over the ferry uh, into Manhattan and North. And then um, he was caught. You see, uh, most um, military put a blind eye on smuggling. They actually benefited from smuggling. They got goods that they might not be able to get elsewhere. It supplemented their rations sometimes. But the government officials felt they had to sometimes make a case against a smuggler just to uphold the law. And so poor Abraham was captured and put in prison. And Jonathan Trumbull was the governor of Connecticut then, and he was a patriot. And Benjamin Talmadge, who was anxious to get his good friend Abraham Woodle out of prison so he could spy for him, he approached Trumbull, and Trumbull agreed to release this young man if he would be a patriot, or was a patriot, although he'd signed a pledge of loyalty to the king, as most uh, Long Islanders had to at that time. Well, was Abraham Woodle a family man? No. I already mentioned that he lived with his two parents, his aging parents. As a matter of fact, Mary was not his wife 
until after the revolution, wasn't the same Mary that had been engaged to his brother. In, eight, in, nine, in eight, 1783, they married. So he did not have a wife and he did not have a little boy. But Turn felt it necessary not only to give him a wife so that he could be an illicit lover, I think, but also a son. And yet Abraham didn't have a son until first after having two girls after the revolution. Well, did Mary and Abe move into the home of his father? No, I mentioned Richard was living with um, Abraham Woodle in his own farmhouse uh, with his wife and his daughter and was a judge and a patriot, was not a wealthy man at all. And Mary and Abe never moved into, him, into a different house because their own house stayed lasting until 1931. And this is a marker. The site of home of Abraham Woodle, chief of Long Island spies under General Washington, built by Richard Woodle, the house was built in 1690, an ancestor of Woodle, and it burned in 1931. And that makes me think of the scene in turn where Abraham and Mary, the wife that didn't exist, are having an argument in the kitchen about a spy code book that she had discovered, which was unlikely. And the British soldier who was stationed, quartered in their home, and he was, that's true, overheard the conversation and he said, stand aside, Mary, and pointed his gun at Abe, and said, um, you're under arrest. So Abraham took out a gun, uh, I'm not sure why, uh, it was a rifle on the wall, I think, and he shot the British officer dead. And of course, Abraham had never shot anything probably except a rabbit or squirrel or a deer, but Turn had him killing this British officer who lay on the floor and Mary said, not to worry, Abe, we'll burn down the house. And she, they went upstairs, took their little boy who did not exist, and Mary, who did not exist, went out of the burning house that was not burning, uh, and so on. So I love this little marker in Setauket that tells us the truth about that house. Well, now why did Abraham Whittle decide to be a spy? Um, Is my microphone muted now? I hope not. You're back on. Thank you. How much did you miss? I'm having a little trouble here. Just about 30 seconds. Oh, thank goodness for that. Okay. So I'll have to go back. Forgive me. Uh, I was on the house. <laughs> so there we go. Um, why did he spy? Why did Abe agree to spy? Not only because he got out of prison, and told his friend he would. But his father's first cousin um, was a, a general, Nathaniel Woodle. And Nathaniel Woodle had been captured by uh, British dragoons uh, on August 28, 1776, when uh, George Washington had sent him from the Battle of Long Island, also called the Battle of Brooklyn, but the Battle of Long Island to Jamaica to, to burn the hay not to leave it there for the British soldiers. And Woodle was captured and brought outside and asked to repeat after the dragoon, God save the king. And Woodle said, God save us all. And that angered the British dragoon. He struck him on the forehead and the shoulder left him to bleed. Uh, it took three weeks for Nathaniel Woodle to die. He got no medical attention and abuse. And when the family heard about that, of course, they were quite upset. And so that might be the reason why Abraham Woodle decided to join up full feet forward with the Patriot cause. So he is given a spy code number by um, Benjamin Talmadge. And he's given an alias, Samuel Culper. How did that name come about? Well, Benjamin Talmadge, who first uh, invited Woodle to join and wanted to keep him safe, said, you need an alias? I'm going to name you after my younger brother, Samuel. I just loved him so much. And Washington, George Washington said, well, I'll take charge of the last name. My first job in, uh, after I was uh, finished with my trainings, really, at age 17, was in Culpeper County. 
and he, he took off a couple of letters and pushed the words together, and there we have Samuel Culper, a gift from, a name, the gift of, Abraham, of George Washington. So there are now three original members of the Culper Ring, Benjamin Talmadge, who's the director of intelligence and leader of this ring, Abraham Woodle, who is assigned to spy in New York City now, gathering information on British troop movements and supplies, and Caleb Brewster, who had volunteered himself in a way to be a spy, and then Benjamin Talmadge made it official. And Benjamin, Caleb Brewster is a whaleboat captain, and here we go. So we've got now General George Washington, the spy master, is also given a code name, his name 711. And that may ring a bell, that name, in the eyes and ears of some of you. But whenever I pass a 711 grocery store, I salute. And maybe you should too. Well, this is the root of the Culper spies so far. We have um, Abraham Woodle, I'm trying to get rid of this thing on my um, top here. Sorry, it's in my way. Abraham Woodle goes into New York City and observes, staying overnight at his um, brother-in-law's boarding house, uh, Amos Underhill's boarding house. And um, Caleb Brewster meets up with him if he can and takes the messages across to Dragoons in um, Fairfield, Connecticut, waiting to bring it to General Talmadge, to, to Benjamin Talmadge, and from there it will be sent to George Washington, wherever he might be. Talmadge always knew where he was, okay? Uh, Abraham Woodle tries to get back to Setauket as often as he can, but he's burdened by having to go into the city often, and he needs somebody to help him, that's for sure. Okay, um, forgive me, please. I'm just jumping ahead. Bear with me, please. Oh dear, my computer is acting up. It's having a personality attack, but this gives you an idea of what we're going to be covering, so there we go. Okay, there's the root. And this is General Washington. And there is Dragoon Major Talmadge who gave himself a code name, number 725, and an alias John Bolton. And now he needs new recruits. They need somebody to go into the city and pick up um, things from, a from Abraham Whittle. They need couriers. And for the beginning time, January to August of 1778, it's a man named Jonas Hawkins. And after that, Austin Rowe. Now I'm glad that uh, that Jonas Hawkins didn't continue in the job too long because he might have been hung as a spy if he'd been caught. And he turned out to be the grandfather of a very famous Long Island artist, William Sidney Mount. So I'm grateful that he turned down the job after six or seven months on the job. Austin Rowe had a tavern in talk at a perfect cover for a spy because he had to go into the city to buy materials for his tavern. And he's known as Long Island's Paul Revere. He's given the code number 724. He's going into Manhattan probably once or twice a week, which is all that um, anybody could expect of him since it's a 55 mile horseback ride each way. So there are childhood friends of Benjamin Talmadge in Setauket, and now they are part of the ring. Um, Benjamin Talmadge, let, let's look at the year 1760, when they all went to a one-room schoolhouse together, building their friendships. Benjamin Talmadge was six, Abraham Whittle was 10, Austin Rowe was 12, Caleb Brewster was 13, all in one room. And they had a neighbor. Her name was Anna Smith Strong, and she was 20 years old. She was 10 years older than Abraham Woodle and um, quite a bit older than Talmadge. She was married for 16 years at that point to a man named Celia Strong, who was a judge. And she had, um, well, she will have eight children at the beginning of this firing. I believe she had seven. So unlikely that she's going to be too active in the ring, although turn does show her as such. 
Let's see. Were Abraham Whittle and Anna Smith Strong lovers? Unlikely, unlikely. She was married to uh, Abraham Whittle's um, relative. They were relatives by marriage. And as I said, she had a big family of her own. She was in her 40s and he's in his late 20s there. And did she learn to write in code from Abe? Definitely not. The only ones who wrote in code were Talmadge and uh, a man we're going to meet soon, Townsend, and Abraham Whittle. And let's talk about Robert Townsend because he's going to become a very important part of this story. Um, Abraham Whittle is getting tired of, of going back and forth 55 miles each way into Manhattan, staying at his brother-in-law's um, boarding house, eavesdropping, taking notes, and then bringing it back to Setauka to have Kayla Brewster pick it up, or maybe Brewster would meet him in Manhattan. So Robert Townsend was also living in the same boarding house. He was a businessman in Manhattan. He had a shop where um, loyalist soldiers um, purchased supplies, and uh, he was a great cover for being a spy. He also worked at Rivington's uh, newspaper, James Rivington's Rivington Gazette, which was a loyalist paper. We'll find out later that Rivington was a double agent. But while we're talking about the beginning of this spy ring in the 78, 1778, uh, he was undercover and Robert Townsend worked for him. Everybody thought Townsend was a loyalist. And so he could eavesdrop in taverns in lower Manhattan and loyalist soldiers and, uh, I'm sorry, British soldiers and loyalist neighbors would talk freely and he would then um, transmit the information out to um, Abraham Whittle via Austin Rowe coming in to pick it up. So Robert Townsend is given an alias of Samuel Culper Jr. and a code number 723. Why Samuel Culper Jr.? Well, now Abraham is Samuel Culper Sr. I guess both Washington and Talmadge got tired of thinking of another name and it was perfect. So here we have Abraham Sr. Culper and Robert Townsend the Jr. Culper. And now Abe can stay in Setauket and wait for messages from Robert Townsend to come to him. Now, Caleb Brewster, the whaleboat captain, is very active too as an artillery man. He's got a whaleboat that is stocked with cannon and when he crossed the Devil's Belt, which is what Long Island Sound was called because it was so dangerous, uh, he would uh, get into skirmishes with the British. He wrote often about his battles, was once wounded. Well, he is um, coming across, let's just review this, Fairfield, Connecticut, right here is where a Brewster and Talmadge was stationed, and um, Abraham Whittle's waiting here in Setauket for Brewster to come over. Meantime, Austin Rowe has gotten into the city to pick up messages from Robert Townsend, brought them back, and Abe has buried them in a dead drop box on his farm, and then Brewster will show up and get them back to Talmadge. Dragoons from the Second Continental Light Dragoons, Sheldon's horse, they will be waiting to pick up messages in Connecticut and they'll get it to Benjamin Talmadge, who will then send it on with Dragoons to George Washington, wherever he is. So, were whale boatmen Caleb Brewster and Dragoon Major Benjamin Talmadge really close friends? The answer is, Yes, this is one of the true things in turn. They were childhood friends in Setauket, went to the same schoolhouse and the same Presbyterian church. All right, here are the characters. We have the farmer, Abraham Woodle, head of day-to-day -day operations, Caleb Brewster, the whaleboat captain and artilleryman, Austin Rowe, the tavern owner. Now, let's look at the um, geography of the neighborhood. Lots of coves and inlets. When Caleb Brewster would come from Connecticut to pick up messages from um, Abraham Woodle, and here was where Abraham Woodle's house was right here on Strong's neck, um, he would sometimes hide in different uh, inlets, uh, waiting to get a signal to, to Abe as to tell him where to meet him. 
there were six possible codes. A legend grew up, and I'll tell you how that began. It may be true, may not be true. Um, there's a drawing from a 1930s children's book of Anna Smith Strong. How old does she look? Maybe 16, maybe 17. She was actually in her mid 40s then. Well, the legend grew that Abraham Woodle would ride by her property, which was occupied by British soldiers. The British commander in the area was occupying her house. She was living in a cottage, probably a slave cottage, because as you know, there were slaves on Long Island, a farm community. Um, she would hang up a handkerchief, a black one, if she knew that Caleb Brewster was nearby. And then she'd hang up the number of white handkerchiefs to show which cove he was in. And since the cove, six of them were numbered one through six, if she hung up two or three, uh, he would know, uh, Abraham Woodle would know which cove to go into to find her. There's a children's book, Red Coats and Petticoats, by a friend of mine. Uh, it's been in print now since 1999. It does very well. It's a children's book about Anna Smith Strong and her laundry line. Again, she's shown as a fairly young woman here. Well, Sela B. Strong III, who was a grandson of Anna and Sela Strong, he authored an article about his grandparents having hosted George Washington in Setauket during the president's 1790 trip. After he becomes president, he tours Long Island. We'll be looking at that in a minute. He was oblivious. He was oblivious to his grandmother's involvement in the cult perspiring because Anna Smith Strong never talked about it, never wrote about it, never said a word about a laundry line, and neither did anybody else. That was uh, in, 17, in 1870 that, um, that her grandson said he'd never heard of that story. 150 years later, Kate Wheeler Strong, a wonderful woman, a woman who lived in Setauket, very intelligent, very devoted to children and to the community. She was the great, great granddaughter of Anna Smith Strong. She wrote about Nancy's clothesline and other Long Island stories from 1939 to 1976. And everybody believed that the stories were true. Well, maybe they were, but there is no written evidence to prove it. There is no primary source to prove it. It is local legend. A lovely local legend. And many people in the historical society today talk about her and give a lot of information that you would love. There's a Tri Spy Tours by Margot Arceri, and I suggest you sign up for one of those online. They're fabulous tours of the um, historic area in Setauket. And the Three Village Historical Society Culper Spy Day, which happens every September. We've had six of them so far. It's online now because the last one was on Zoom uh, because of COVID. It also talks about her, about Anna Strong, and I recommend that you go to the website and find it. Meantime, what is Benjamin Talmadge doing? He's developing a code of 710 words for 40, 53 proper names and numbers to uh, secure the writing of his spies. He wants them to write in code. Here's a transcription. You can't read it, I'm sure, except for the headline. So I'll tell you there's a mixed up alphabet way that they write, substituting one letter for another. They give numbers to months of the year. They give numbers to proper names. Washington was 7-Eleven. Uh, numbers are used sometimes in place of, of uh, words. And important words are given numbers. A wonderful code, 710. Well, an improvement was to be able to write words in sympathetic ink, in what we call invisible ink. Uh, a man named Sir James Jay, an Englishman, a doctor, a chemist, who's also the brother of John Jay, who is very active in the revolution and in Congress later, and certainly in Washington's first cabinet. But at this time, in the 1779, 
John Jay receives the stain, the, what they called sympathetic stain from Sir James Jay, gave it to General Washington and Washington received it from, a uh, Talmadge received it from Washington in April. And he shares it with Abraham Woodle. So how George Washington helped the cult of spies fool the British, letter, letters were written in Talmadge's code, letters were written in sympathetic stain, which we call invisible ink, and then he gave advice to Robert Townsend in Manhattan to write secret messages between the lines of family messages written in ordinary ink. Uh, we have a letter at the university, Stony Brook University of New York, um, which the library there, special collections under Kristen Nitre, has two letters, maybe three now, Christian, uh, from the Culpers to Washington and from Washington back to the Culpers. Uh, and in that one of the letters, he's advising Townsend to use the sympathetic stain and write between the lines of ordinary letters, ordinary lines. And that's how we get the expression, read between the lines, because the invisible words were written between the lines of, of letters written in ink. Well, now, what did Benjamin Talmadge do? You could choose the best answer if you want. Gave his spies aliases, invented a secret code, brought them invisible ink, or all of the above. And I'm sure that's the choice you would make. Now, I want you to remember that Benjamin Talmadge had other duties besides being a spy master. He's in the Light Dragoons in Children's Horse, and he's fighting all over the place in New Jersey, New York, even down in Virginia, Long Island, the Battle of Fort St. George, very prominent. George Washington rewarded him for that accomplishment. I recommend that you go to Google all of these battles if you wish to learn the details. But Talmadge was quite a soldier as well as quite a spy master. So what proof do we have that any of the cult aspiring chapter of the American Revolution is true? And the answer is primary sources prove the story. And there are two kinds of primary sources. And there's only one here that is the correct answer. And if you read letters and diaries or letters in newspapers or newspapers and diaries or newspapers in Wikipedia, the only possible right answer I'm sure you historians and others will agree is letters and diaries. Even newspapers can't always be trusted. And although diaries can uh, magnify somebody's glory if they wish, we usually look upon them as very, very accurate. So Benjamin Talmadge wrote his own um, uh, journal, and it was published in 1858 by his son, his memoirs. One part of it says, this year in 78, I opened a private correspondence with some persons in New York. He never named them, which lasted through the war. I kept one or more boats continually employed in crossing the sound on this business, and the private correspondence is with his spies. Did the Culp of Spies help win the American Revolution? That's the important question, or was it just wasting their time? There are two things that they're noted for in particular. One has to do with this dollar. The a dollar bill, well, let me read this to you because I think it's worth recording very accurately. Robert Townsend overheard talk of counterfeiting by the British. Flooding the economy would lead to crippling inflation. Food prices already staggering would double. The most crucial part of Townsend's report was that the British had procured, quote, several reams of paper made for the last emission struck by Congress, unquote, emission of bills. This was terrible news for American leaders. The British had previously been forced to counterfeit money on paper that was similar to the official paper, but now they had the authentic paper. Thus, distinguishing between real and fake money would be virtually impossible. As a result, Congress was forced to recall all its bills in circulation, a major ordeal, but one that saved the war with a war effort by not allowing counterfeit money to flood the market. And another way had to do with something that Benjamin Franklin accomplished. Benjamin Franklin in the fall of 76, the beginning of the war, was sent by Congress as ambassador to France to try to get help from the French. Why would the French king and queen want to give us help? Well, they didn't like the British. The British had just defeated them in the French and Indian War. They had to give up territory in Canada. So Americans felt 
rightly really, that the French would be likely allies. So Benjamin Franklin went over to Paris. He asked Louis, Louis, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, the king and queen, to send ships and soldiers to help General Washington defeat the British. And those two beautiful people still had their heads. It's uh, a decade or so before the French Revolution, which many people feel was caused in part by the fact that the French did send money to America and they taxed the French people horribly after that to help pay for it. That was only part of it. It's a long story. So the French army set sail in May of 1780 for Newport, Rhode Island, commanded by French General Jean-Baptiste Donatien de Vameur, Comte de Rochambeau. Please forgive my French, did the best I could. And they're going to, um, He's arriving in Newport. If the British know it, they're going to go from New York where their ships are and their, and their army, and they'll sail with their troops to Newport. So this is important information for um, General, General Washington to know. And so there's a letter from George Washington to Benjamin Talmadge, July 11th, 1780, quote, as we may every moment expect the arrival of the French fleet, the correspondence with the Culpers will be of very great importance. Well, Robert Townsend overheard news of the greatest importance. It had to be delivered to General Washington at once. The British knew that the French were coming. Actually, the French arrived in Newport on July 10th, 1780, a day before this letter went out, which tells you about the state of communication in the 1780s. So General Washington had to be told at once, and Robert Townsend wrote between the lines of an ordinary bill of fare uh, that the news was that 8,000 British soldiers were being sailed up to Newport. Lucky for uh, Washington and Talmadge and all of us, uh, Austin Rowe showed up that day. It might have been a couple of days before he came, but he came that day and took the letter very quickly. And of course, we know the route. He went right back to Setauket with it, uh, knocked on Abraham Whittle, well, didn't knock on the door, buried the letter in the dead, do dead box, dead drop box that Woodhull always checked frequently at night. And when Woodhull found the letter, here it is in the original uh, it's a facsimile of the original, but I've transcribed it. It says, sir, and the, the sir is Brewster. Abraham Woodle is writing to the whaleboat man Brewster, who, who he knows will take this letter. He says the enclosed, meaning this is a cover letter for Robert Townsend's important letter. The enclosed requires your immediate departure this day. By all means, let not an hour pass, for this day must not be lost. You have news of the greatest consequence consequence, perhaps, that ever happened to your country. John Bolton, meaning Benjamin Talmadge, must uh, order your return when he think proper. In other words, come back another time to do what Talmadge wants. Right now, take this immediately. And he passes it on to Brewster. And then Brewster gets it, of course, over to the Dragoons, and they get it to Washington's headquarters. And who is there? July 21st, 1780. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton on Washington's staff. He received Townsend's urgent letter that 50 British transport ships were sailing up Long Island Sound to Newport, Rhode Island, carrying 8,000 troops to attack the French. He warned both Rochambeau and Washington. Alexander Hamilton did. Um, another fact, British ships set sail for Rhode Island, but soon turned back to Manhattan. They set sail from New York, some through Long Island Sound to Newport, and some around Long Island. Why did the British ships turn back has always been asked. Why didn't they sail to Newport, Rhode Island to attack the French? And it has to do with the fact that General Washington is a wonderful spy master. He knew he could not assemble his own troops and get them up to Newport to work, to fight alongside of the French against the British. There wasn't time, he didn't have the ability. So he tricked the British. He wrote a letter, uh, presumably to his generals, saying that if the British left New York to go to Newport to attack the French, 
he, Washington, would bring all his troops into New York and get it back. Some historians say that Washington tricked it, and that is what I believe. If so, the plan worked and the French army was saved because Clinton, uh, British General Henry Clinton in New York, um, made a tactical error not only believing this uh, false letter, but thinking that saving New York City was more important than, than fighting the French and getting the French defeated. Because a year later, those French battleships, uh, French battleships, the Ville de Paris and Auguste, went down to Virginia uh, for the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, it took Rochambeau and Washington a year to decide that it was time for them to combat, to, to uh, attack the British head on at a vulnerable spot. And the vulnerable spot was the peninsula where Yorktown was situated. So a battle took place with French battleships defeating the British battleships that were blockading, that were at Yorktown and chasing them away so that then the French ships could stay there and blockade Yorktown and prevent the British from getting more supplies and men. This is called the most important naval victory of the 18th century, September 5th, 1781, when the French battleships fought the British ships and chased them away from, from um, Yorktown in Chesapeake Bay. Three weeks later, surrender of Lord Cornwallis because his men are starved out. In addition, of course, both uh, the Marquis de Lafayette and Alexander Hamilton were there with Washington uh, fighting as um, captains, majors, and they um, led redoubts. They, they fought at the redoubts. Um, they attacked the British soldiers in their redoubts and won. So there was some fighting, but mostly it was blockading. The surrender of Lord Cornwallis on October 19, 1781. Again, another painting by John Trumbull. And let's see if I can get it to go. Yes. There's a song that the British soldiers sang as they laid down their arms and marched between the French and the British armies. If you look closely at this painting, the uh, British soldiers are on one side, the French soldiers, pardon me, are on one side on the left, the American soldiers with Washington on one side at the right, Rochambeau on the left, Washington on the right, and the British soldiers being led between them, laying down their arms, and they sang. I won't sing, I'll recite it. If ponies rode men and grass ate cows and cats were chased into holes by the mouse, if summer were spring and the other way round, then all the world would be upside down. It was very hard for the British to believe that there they had lost America. It was the small um, group of Americans, patriots, who defeated the British. Rochambeau and the French, of course, gave a tremendous hand, and in Newport there's a statue of him. And for the 150th anniversary in 1931, there's a two cent stamp with Rochambeau and uh, the Comte de Glace who led the French fleet and Washington. So there's an epilogue. The British were very upset and would not um, agree to sit for a painting by uh, Benjamin West uh, of the treaty signing. We have the treaty signing with John Jay, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Henry Lawrence, and William Templeton Franklin, uh, the grandson. But the British commissioners refused to sit. The treaty was only signed in 1783, two years after the Battle of Yorktown. Some skirmishes and battles still took place, but the war was really over. And finally, they evacuated on November 18th. Uh, someone pulled down the um, Union Jack, which you can see flying off, and the American Stars and Stripes 13 colonies blown. Washington entered triumphantly and um, said farewell a week later to his soldiers at Francis Tavern, returned to Mount Vernon, but the country needed him. Uh, they Congress unanimous, 
unanimously after he took part in um, the uh, congressional sessions that wrote the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention. He was the chief of the Constitutional Convention because both sides admired him and they felt that the uh, Constitution would be approved if Washington was the head of it. And then he became president, took the oath of office April 30th, 1789, took a farewell trip around Long Island in April 1790, a few months after he took office. He left Manhattan by coach, went along the south shore of Long Island, north through Coram, where Benjamin Talmadge's victory took place at the Battle of Coram. Um, went to a Setauket. Here he's shown first at Sacticos. This is reenactors, of course. Sacticos Manor is one of the stops on the South Shore. Then he went to Row Tavern on the North Shore. He spent the night of April 22nd at the house of, quote, Captain Row, which is tolerably decent with obliging people in it. And uh, Austin Row and his wife and um, Celia Strong and Anna were definitely present to honor him that night. So what happened to General Washington's spies? Caleb Brewster married and settled in Fairfield, Connecticut and started a business and buried there. Uh, Robert Townsend lived at Raynham Hall. Uh, he, um, let me go back. It's easier for me if I point to these, so I'll do that. Austin Rowe the uh, Long Island's Paul Revere. He opened a second tavern, so he had one in Setauken and Patchog, married, had eight children, died in Patchog, is buried there. Caleb Brewster, the whaleboat man, as I just mentioned, went to live in um, Black Rock, Connecticut, was a blacksmith and a businessman. Uh, he is uh, remained friends with Benjamin Talmadge his whole life. He's buried in um, Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, Abraham Woodle, buried married in Setauket, married Mary finally, or got married mar ma married finally after the revolution, had three children, became a local judge. His name was always honored and his tomb is well decorated in the Presbyterian church. Robert Townsend, loner, um, a, a depressed man many times. He never married. He lived in Raynham Hall, the family mansion, which is now a museum. I hope you'll visit in Oyster Bay. And um, he raised a boy who was given the name Robert Townsend Jr., but many people believe he was the illeg illegitimate son of his brother, William. Um, but um, Ro Robert Townsend raised this boy and was always rather pessimistic. He asked Congress, he asked Washington for a job, a government job after the war, never got it. Let's look now at Benjamin Talmadge. Colonel Benjamin Talmadge, two port uh, a portrait uh, of his son, William, uh, his eldest son. And this is what he's wearing, the badge, uh, the medal of the Society of the Cincinnati, right on his shoulder, which is given to officers, both American and French officers, who fought with Washington during the revolution. His wife, Mrs. Benjamin Talmadge, with their second son, Henry Floyd, an infant here, and the daughter, Mariah Jones. Uh, they went on to have four more children. Ralph Earl was the portraitist for each of these. Uh, Mary Floyd is her name. She was the daughter of William Floyd, who signed the Declaration of Independence from Mastic on Long Island. She had been offered the hand in marriage of um, <laughs> what happened here. That was not good. Okay. Um, James Madison asked Mary to marry him, Mary Floyd, and she turned him down for Benjamin Talmadge. So that tells you what people thought of Benjamin. And here's a portrait of Congressman Benjamin Talmadge by Ezra Ames of 1800. It's in the Litchfield Historical Society collection. He was a member of the United States House of Representatives from Connecticut at Lard District for eight years terms. He married Mary Floyd and then went immediately to Litchfield where he lived and died and he's buried there. Well admired and renowned. He died at age 81 on March 7th, 1835. To the end he praised the efforts of those quote untrumped unknown unquote members of his firing who helped secure victory against the British. 
Who might these other trumped up unknown spies have been? There are many unknown spies, but I'll just name a couple. Hercules Mulligan, who is buried right near Alexander Hamilton in Trinity Church. He spied for Hamilton in New York, a simple tailor. Uh, James Rivington, who uh, ran the newspaper, the Royal Gazette, it, the, it, the banner said, printer to the king's most excellent majesty, but he was secretly an agent. Uh, in the beginning, before the war, he was a loyalist, but he became a patriot later on after the war was underway. These are other spies um, whose names you might know, but I'm going to look at the bottom. There are two women, Sally Townsend, the sister of Robert Townsend, uh, who got the first Valentine from um, General Simcoe. General Simcoe was the villain in turn. He was supposed to be in Setauket, but he was really in Oyster Bay, and he wasn't as bad as he was depicted. Well, they say that she overheard a conversation about Major John Andre and passed that on to her brother. We don't know if that's true. Maybe it is. And then there's Agent 355, which is pure myth. Um, when when um, Brian Kilmeade wrote George Washington's Secret Six, who are the six, I thought. We have one, Major Talmadge, number two, Woodhull, number three, Townsend, number four, Rowe, number five, um, Brewster. Who was six? Did he mean Anna Smith Strong? No, he meant Agent 355, who was supposedly somebody who gathered with the British in Manhattan and passed on information. We don't know that she ever existed. There's no proof of it. So the members of the Culp Aspiring went to their graves without speaking of their exploits. It was only in the 1930s that their story came to light. And a man named Morton Pennypacker, a historian on Long Island, uh, in 1939 wrote the history of the Long Island spy ring and included some of the legend of Anna Smith Strong, but um, we're not positive. It's still considered folklore. I thank you for listening. It was my pleasure. And now I'll turn this back to the Pequot Library. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was amazing and enlightening, and we were so glad that you were able to join us today. Thank you. Um, let me, I'm just trying to make sure I can see everybody. Ah, there we go. So I think that about wraps up our program. Do you have time for any questions that may have been left in the chat? If they have time, I have time. Okay, well, we have one in here, and I apologize in advance because I think a two year old is about to run into my bedroom. I keep forgetting that we're really remote. Yes, yeah, so the first question from Beverly Tyler is What is the source of the whaleboat drawing on your second slide? Ah, uh, now I should give credit to uh, the Three Village Historical Society, firstly for using many of those images in their own work. Um, many of them are from the um, Setauket School. Those would be the uh, images of Austin Rowe and of Benjamin, uh, of um, Caleb Brewster. Uh, if you visit Setauket and walk by the Setauket School, you'll see them. But the source of that particular drawing, Bev, uh, you're a good friend and you put me on the spot, so I'm gonna ask you for the answer. I know it is from one of the books that I have referred to. I think it might be one of um, the illustrations that were used in a Kate Wheeler Strong's uh, Tales of Long Island. But you correct me, please. Does he write his answer or do we hear his answer? He did not write his answer. Bev, would you like to speak? I don't know, uh, Elizabeth. That's why okay. I asked. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> if I can find it among my papers, I will certainly give it to you. Thank you. Any Anything else? Just a few Elizabeth. things. Elizabeth? Uh, yes. It's Eric Chandler from the current Second Dragoons. How are you? Happy oh, New Year. I'm so glad, you know, the Second Dragoons visited us in Setauket about 10 years ago. Wonderful group of, of reenactors and um, historians. So thank you for joining today. Well, first off, Happy New Year. Thank you. 
And uh, just uh, just a note, you know, before there was Turn, there was a 1955 movie called The Red Coat starring Stuart Granger and Ooh. Francis and George Sanders. Uh, Stuart Granger plays uh, Colonel John Bolton of the second Connecticut Light Horse. And the movie is centered around the, uh, the Arnold Andre affair. Ah. It, um, of course, is as accurate as any historical movie made in the mid 1950s, but it does at least cover the broad strokes. Well, I'll have to look for that. Thank you for that. Sure. We just have some thanks from Lou Almeida says it was wonderful seeing you. Thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Michelle is sorry she cannot attend. Hope to see you again when circumstances permit. Rochelle Almeida is a good friend. Lou's wife spoke at the Pequot Library about two months ago about um, um, writing memoirs, uh, how an individual person should go about writing his or her own memoir. She's a wonderful woman and quite uh, brilliant. And Lou, um, I hope to see you soon one of these days. Wonderful. And then from Carolyn Emerson, she says, thank you, Liz, your illustrations really help to visualize the battles and progressions of the American Revolution. Thank you. She's a, a librarian at the uh, Emma Clark Library in Setauket. So I'm glad you could join us today, Carolyn. And Jacqueline Grennan Brooks says, you are brilliant and so knowledgeable. She learns something every time she hears you speak. Very gracious. Thank you for that. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much again for your time um, and your knowledge and for sharing with us. And thank you everybody for coming and being a part of this presentation. Um, we look forward to seeing you all for our next one. Elizabeth, I hope we can see you at the library again sometime soon. I'd love it, thank you. Wonderful. And uh, please forgive my pesky computer that has a life of its own. <laughs> I thought it was great. Seamless. Absolutely seamless. Have a nice afternoon, everyone.